join me in welcoming General Norman Schwarzkopf. Please be seated. You all have gotten bigger since the last time I talked to you. I, I distinctly remember the last time I had an opportunity to address the Corps of Cadets. It was November 1967, and I was here as an instructor in the Department of Mechanics, which I understand is still the favorite department of all of the people in well, well, at least it was then, anyhow, all right? But um, Army had a great football team that year, and uh, they had been invited to go to the Sugar Bowl. But as you recall, in 1967, we also had something going on called the Vietnam War, a deadly, serious battle that the Army was very much involved in. And for reasons, uh, and I think very good reasons, of the fact that the Secretary of the Army, then Secretary of Resor, felt, felt that uh, the frivolity of a bowl game was not, in, not really in keeping with the fact that soldiers were dying in Vietnam, he decided that the Army team would not go to the bowl game. The week he made that decision, I had been asked to speak in the then mess hall uh, to the rally before the pit game. It was uh, significant that they were having the rally in the mess hall because up until uh, we were going through the renovation and there was a tremendous amount of construction that was going on in the mess hall at that time, expanding to another wing. And, uh, and so all the rallies had been moved elsewhere, but this was the one rally of the year that was going to happen in the cadet mess. And I had, of course, been invited to speak. And the afternoon I was getting ready to speak, one of the rabble-rousers came up to me and slipped me a note. And it said, Major Schwarzkopf, I just wanted you to know that tonight, after your speech, there is going to be a riot in the mess hall. <laughs> and we are going to tear down all of the new construction. And oh, by the way, last night we stole all the sugar bowls out of the mess hall, and they will never be returned again. And um, I, I began to really be delighted with the fact that I was going to be giving this speech before the rally. <laughs> uh, to further compound my problems, um, the Commandant of Cadet called me in and said, uh, what is it you're going to say tonight, Schwarzkopf? And before you say one word, you better clearly understand that if there's a riot after your speech, we're blaming you, too. You understand that? <laughs> um, I won't tell you the outcome, but needless to say, before I accepted this invitation, I checked with the court to make sure there are no riots scheduled this evening, and I expect to hold you to your promise. One has to ask oneself, what do you say to the leaders of the 21st century? Because that's what you are. You are America's leaders of the 21st century. I'm in the twilight of a mediocre career, and in three short months, I'm gone. Because that's the Army way, and that's the right way. Because we can't have the top plugged up and block the upward movement of many, many other outstanding leaders that are out there. So what does an old war horse in his last three months in the Army say to the leaders of the 21st century. I've thought about this a lot, but fundamentally, it turns out that you are no different than I. And therefore, I think that some of the lessons that I have learned in 35 years in the Army are applicable to you, who this year or next year or the year after or the year after are going to be leading this great Army of ours. And I thought I'd talk about them just a little bit. First of all, let me talk about the environment when I graduated, we graduated, in 1956. There weren't going to be any more wars. We had a President of the United States that was the last great military leader, and he had adopted a military strategy of massive retaliation. 
simply stated, we told the world that anyone who dared attack the vital interests of the United States of America would be faced with nuclear destruction. There were many in that day that were espousing that there is absolutely no need for an army. We ought to get rid of it, expand the size of our nuclear weaponry, expand the size of our air force, but ground battles will never be fought again. I've been to war four times since then. And I've been to war in four places that in 1956, no one, absolutely no one, would have ever predicted that we would go to war. I can remember when I was a plebe, there was something going on over in a place called Yen Bien Phu, and I don't really remember very well what it was, because I wasn't interested in that. After all, who cared about a tiny little place way over in Southeast Asia someplace? And when Dien Bien Phu fell, it didn't even impress us. A couple of left-wing, commie, pinko social science instructors tried to get us interested. <laughs> But of course, we all knew what their politics were, so we didn't pay any attention to them. <laughs> and certainly, certainly, we didn't know where Grenada was. As a matter of fact, when I was told I was going to Grenada, I said, that's great, I've always wanted to go to Spain. <laughs> and there was a philosophy in the world at that time, and particularly, particularly in the United States of America, that the United States of America would never, ever, ever get involved in a major ground war in the Middle East. Never. And that's the environment that we, the class of 56, graduated to. A man with far more eloquence than I will ever have stood outside Washington Hall a few years ago and told the Corps of Cadets that ours is the profession of arms. And told us that our mission would never change. Our mission was to fight our nation's wars. And he also told us that we could not fail in that mission. I would tell you that there were many, many hours during the planning for a desert storm that those words gave me great strength because they are basic truth about the United States Military Academy, West Point, and the Long Gray Line. You, you out here will lead the thunder and lightning of this country in some future conflict. History has proven to all of us that in your careers there will be another war. And you will be the leaders. So what about that? A lot of people are calling the war that we just won, the video game wars. A lot of people are talking about the great technology. But they've been talking about that since the day we graduated. In the final analysis, you should never forget that the airplanes don't fly, the tanks don't run, the ships don't sail, the missiles don't fire, unless the sons and daughters of America make them do it. It's just that simple. So entrusted to you, the mothers and fathers of America will give you their sons and daughters. 
and they will hand you their sons and daughters with confidence in you, the leaders of the 21st century, that you will not needlessly waste their lives. And you dare not. You absolutely dare not. And that's the burden that the mantle of leadership places upon you. And it's lonesome. Let me tell you, it's terribly, terribly lonesome to realize that you could be the person that gives the orders that will bring about the death of thousands and thousands of young men and women whose lives have been placed in your hands. It is an awesome responsibility and one that you must prepare yourself for. And as MacArthur said, you have no choice when that mantle of leadership is put on your shoulders. You cannot fail. You dare not fail because this entire nation will depend upon you at that time. What kind of a leader must a leader of the 21st century be? You know, they're having a big discussion about this in America today. They're talking about how the army turned itself around, how we changed. And they're saying that because there's such a terrible lack of leadership in American industry today, that perhaps the army should be studied to find out what our secret formula was that caused us to change the way we did business and get rid of all those lousy, incompetent leaders that we had out there and come up with some leaders that could finally win a war. That's bull. We didn't lose in Vietnam, not militarily. I gotta tell you, I never, I never was in a single battle in Vietnam that we lost, not a one. Matter of fact, we kicked the hell out of a BC and the NBA in every battle I was ever in. But we did lose something in Vietnam. We lost our integrity. There was a terrible erosion of integrity within our leadership in Vietnam. Not everybody, I'm not condemning everyone, but I am saying that is a fact of life. And we just, just could not allow that to continue. And you can't let it happen on your watch. To be a 21st century leader, you must have two things, competence and character. I've met a lot of leaders that were very, very competent. But they didn't have character. And for every job they did well in the Army, they sought reward in the form of promotions, in the form of awards and decorations, in the form of getting ahead at the expense of somebody else, in the form of another piece of paper that awarded them another degree, and the only reason why they wanted that was because that was a sure road to faster promotion to somehow get to the top. You see, these were very competent people but they lacked character. Now, on the other hand, I've met a lot of leaders out there who had superb character, but they weren't willing, they weren't willing to hold their own feet to the fire. They weren't willing to pay the price of leadership. They were not willing to go the extra mile, to do the extra little bit because that's what it took to be a great leader. And none of those leaders are with us. None of those leaders would lead in battle. Because the bottom line to everything is, again, when you lead in battle, when you lead in battle, you are leading people. You are leading human beings. I've seen competent leaders who stood in front of a platoon and saw it as a platoon. 
but I've seen great leaders who stood in front of a platoon and saw it as 44 individuals, each of whom has their hopes, each of whom has their aspirations, each of whom wants to live, each of whom wants to do good. People don't join the military to do poorly. Nobody goes downtown and says, gee, I think I'll enlist in the army so I can screw up. They don't do that. They say, I think I will enlist in the army because I want to do better. And if they fail, their leader fails. So you must have competence and you must have character. And some great man once said that character in a man is only seen, a man or a woman, excuse me. But character is only seen in a man or a woman when nobody is watching them. It's not what a man or woman does when they're being watched that demonstrates their character. It's what they do when they are not being watched that demonstrates their true character. And that's sort of what it's all about. You are going to be the leaders of the 21st century. And to lead in the 21st century, to take soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen into battle, you will be required to have both competence and character. And you say, how do I do that? How do I do that? The answer is very simple. And I guess this is what I really want to tell you most of all. You're being taught every day here at this great institution how to do that. I have a classmate, a little short fella, Jewish, comes from New Jersey, was what we call in the Army a late bloomer. But he rose to the rank of Lieutenant General, one of the, is one of the most ethical and moral people I've ever met. And I was discussing with him one day what it is that gave him his great character. And he said, Norm, that's easy. He said, you know, when I went to West Point, I was one of those guys that really believed what they told us up there. And I still do. Out there among you, they're the cynics. They're the people that scoff at what you're learning here. There's the people that scoff at character. There are the people that scoff at hard work. But they don't know what they're talking about, let me tell you. And I can assure you that when the going gets tough and your country needs them, they're not going to be there. They will not be there. But you will. What's the magic formula? After Vietnam, we had a whole cottage industry develop, centered basically in Washington, D.C., that consisted of a bunch of military ferries that had never been shot at at anger, who felt fully qualified to comment on the leadership ability of all of the leaders in the United States Army. Uh, they were not Monday morning quarterbacks, they were the worst of all possible kind, they were Friday afternoon quarterbacks. They felt qualified to criticize us before the game was even played. And they talked about great operational concepts and plans and maneuvers, never understanding, never understanding that when the battle is finally fought, the plan goes out the window when you cross the line of departure because there's always some son of a bitch in this choreographed dance that you have planned who climbs out of the orchestra pit with a bayonet and chases you around the stage.
And they're the same ones who were saying, my goodness, we have a terrible problem in the armed forces because there are no more leaders out there. There are no more combat leaders. Where are the Pattons? Where are the Eisenhowers? Where are the Bradleys? Where are the MacArthur's? Where are the Audie Murphy's? They're all gone. We don't have any out there. Now, I say, coming from a guy who's never been shot at in his entire life, that's a pretty bold statement. <laughs> but you see, they were out there. And they are out there, and you will be out there. Because the Pattons and the Bradleys and the Audie Murphys and the Joe Clemens, they're not running around during peacetime killing people, I hope to hell. <laughs> it takes a war to demonstrate that we have these people in our ranks. And our ranks are loaded with them. They are loaded with them. And you are going to be one of them when you join our ranks. And if there's any doubt in anybody's mind, or was any doubt in anybody's mind, there sure as hell isn't any doubt now, because it took us 100 hours to kick the ass of the fourth largest army in the world. <laughs> we do it? Where do those heroes come from? One more time. They were you. Confidence with character. That's what you must have. That's what you're going to carry with you from West Point. Those of you who really believe what you're learning here. The hell with a cynic. Believe it. Believe it, believe it, believe it, because you must believe it if you are going to be a leader of the 21st century military. You must believe it. If you leave here with the word duty implanted in your mind, if you leave here with the word honor carved into your soul. If you leave here with love of country stamped on your heart, then you will be a 21st century leader, worthy, and I do mean worthy, of the great privilege and honor that you will have, whether it's at platoon level, company level, battalion level, brigade level, division level, corps level, or theater level. The great honor and privilege you will have of leading the magnificent young men and women who are the sons and daughters of America. who are the thunder and lightning of Desert Storm. Thank you very much.